Okay, cool. Uh, welcome everyone to this last day of ITCS. Uh, so for the first session, the session will be on machine learning. Uh, so you remember the format. We have uh, five talks, eight minutes each talk. And then after that, we have a panel where we can ask all the questions. Feel free, if you do have a clarification question, feel free to ask during the talk. Uh, but for the deeper question, let's keep them uh, at the end. And for the first talk, we have Kun He from Shenzhen University. Hello, everyone. Today, I will talk about dynamic inference in probabilistic graphical models. This is joint work with Weiming, Xiaoming, and Yitong. At first, let me define the graphical model. Given a graph, it will be the set of vertices and E be the set of edges. Suppose each vertex is a random variable that takes its value from the finite domain Q, and each edge is a constraint defined on its variables. For each variable V, we give it a weight function phi V. The function marks the assignment of V to a real number. For each constraint E, we give it a function phi e. This function marks the assignment of all the variables in this constraint to a real number. Thus, for each configuration sigma in Q to the V, where a configuration is an assignment of all the random variables, the weight of sigma is e to the sum of the weight function's power. Now, we can use variables, constraints, domain, and weight functions to specify a graphic model. The graphic model defines a Gibbs, distrib a Gibbs distribution such that the probability of each, of each configuration is, is proportional to its weight. The graphic model is important in many research, in many research areas one of the most important computational tasks for a graphic model is to estimate the distribution of a vector of random variables. This problem is well motivated and also well studied. Given a graphic model, there are three kinds of inference problem, including the marginal inference, the posterior inference, and the maximum posterior inference. There are different methods for probabilistic inference. In all these methods, the MCMC sampling is the most widely applicable. Given a graphic model, the sampling algorithm draws random samples from its Gibbs distribution. Thus, one can perform the inference by sampling as follows. Firstly, draw an I independent samples X from mu i such that the total variance distance between x and mu i is bounded. In the next, estimate the target probabilities that i from these samples. Nowadays, the big data proposes new challenges for the inference algorithms. The, gra the graphic models from big data only have huge size. Moreover, these models are updated frequently. So the difference between the in instance between before and after an update is only small. For these models, running the whole inference algorithm for each update is too time cost. For example, if the MCMC sampling is used, the expected running time is no less than the product of an i and the size of v. However, the size of v can be as large as several billions. The size and an i can be as large as several millions. Another example is the practical algorithms for learning the graphic models. In these algorithms, the optimal model, i star, is obtained 
by updating the parameters of the graph model iteratively. For these algorithms, running the core inference algorithm for each update is also to time cost. Thus, in this paper, we consider the dynamic inference problem. Given a graph model i, and set i denote the target probability vector, and that hat i denote its estimator. In dynamic inference, we will know the graph model itself can change dynamically with time. Specifically, one can add and limit variables and constraints and change the weight functions. The goal is to calculate the new estimator that hat i prime. My question in this paper is that can we modify that hat i to that hat i prime with a small incremental cost such that that hat i prime is a reasonable estimator? Thus, the dynamic inference problem can be formulated as follows. The input is the original instance i, the original estimator that hat i, and the updated instance i prime. The output should be a new estimator of the updated instance. To accelerate the inference algorithm, extra data structure resided in the memory is also a node. In this paper, we assume that all the updates are generated by a of, offline adversary. In other words, the updated is independent with the randomness used by the algorithm. We also assume that the difference between i and i prime is bounded. Otherwise, there is no faster algorithm, algorithm there is no faster dynamic algorithm than the static inference. Here, the difference between the two instances is defined as follows. Main contribution of this work is a new algorithm that solves the dynamic inference problem efficiently. For broad, for broad class of graph models, our algorithm is fast. We prove that if I and I prime has polylog rhythmic bounded maximum degree and satisfy the Dobrich Salosman condition, then the expected running time of our algorithm is bounded by the sum of Ni prime and the size of V prime. Actually, for most of such instances, the only applicable static inference algorithm is the MCMC sampling. Thus, the expected running time of the static sampling is no less than the product of Ni prime and the size of V prime. Therefore, our dynamic algorithm achieves a significant speed up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, great, perfectly on time. Um, so we are now going to move to the next uh, talk. Okay, should I, should I start? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Jonathan, and I'll be telling you a little bit about the paper Interactive Proof for Verifying Machine Learning. This is a joint work with Shafi Goldwasser, Guy Rosblum, and Amir Udayo. <clears throat> and the question we considered is, when is verifying cheaper than learning? And we're all familiar with the idea that for some computational tasks, finding a, a, a solution can be a lot harder than verifying a solution provided by somebody else. But what about supervised machine learning? Are there supervised machine learning tasks where finding a good hypothesis is a lot harder than verifying a hypothesis provided by somebody else? And of course, we're interested in knowing uh, are there cases like that? When is that the case? How big can the gap be between learning and verifying and so on? And the model we use is the following. 
So there's some unknown distribution that provides <clears throat> uh, sample of the form uh, some instance and the label of that instance. And there is a verifier who is interested in finding a hypothesis that can predict the label for that distribution. <clears throat> However, the verifier doesn't want to do all the hard work of finding that hypothesis by itself, and therefore it can use the help of a learner or prover which is another party that might have more computational resources, but is not trusted. Both the verifier and the prover can take samples from the unknown distribution, and they can send each other messages. When they finish the interaction, the verifier will either output some hypothesis or reject the interaction. Let's see an example where this kind of setting is useful. So imagine you're, uh, you have some commercial setting where there's a company V, the verifier, that's interested in performing some machine learning tasks, and they choose to outsource that machine learning task to another company, the provider, uh, or prover, P. What P is supposed to do is it's supposed to collect a lot of high-quality data and invest a lot of uh, compute power and so on on training a good machine learning model for this particular task. And then they send whatever model they develop to the verifier. And the verifier sees, let's say, that this model has an accuracy of perhaps 80%. So keep in mind that the verifier can always get a good estimate of what the true accuracy of the model is simply by taking you know, a small number of samples and seeing what percentage of them were labeled correctly by this model. But if we see that the accuracy is 80%, should the verifier accept or reject? Maybe 80% is the best possible, but maybe if the, maybe the verifier was actually not doing a very good job and if they would have invested more resources, et cetera, then they would have gotten to 95%. So should the verifier accept or reject? So inspired by the uh, definition of pack learning, probably approximately correct learning from learning theory, uh, we propose a definition of pack verification, which goes as following. So there's some class H of functions from a domain X to label 0, 1. And there's a loss function, which for each hypothesis in the class tells us how good or bad it performs in predicting the labels. And uh, the objective is to get low loss. And then there's this number here, opt, which is the best possible loss that one can achieve using hypothesis from the class H. So this is the minimal possible loss. And the objective of the verifier would be to output a hypothesis uh, that with high probability satisfies this inequality, which says that the, the loss of the hypothesis is nearly optimal, it's mo it most epsilon worse than optimal. And as I said earlier, Estimating the loss of the particular hypothesis uh, provided by the prover is uh, relatively easy from Hofstinger's inequality. You can take a small number of samples and that would be a good estimate. However, it's much harder for the verifier to know what the value of opt is because opt involves the losses of all the hypothesis in the class H, which might be a big and complicated class. <clears throat> and that's where the prover comes in. The prover basically needs to convince the verifier that opt is large enough to satisfy this inequality. Let's see an example where this is possible. So we call this certificates of large loss. And the class we're using is the simple uh, threshold function over the interval 0, 1. So you start off at 0, and then at some point, it jumps up to 1. And you want to find the, the, the best point to jump up to 1. And um, so what the prover can do uh, for this particular class is it can send uh, two sets, A and B. Each of them is an event within the probability space of the unknown distribution, where A is uh, the event that a point falls within this interval and is labeled 1. So it looks like this. And B is also an interval. It's the, it's a probability, it's the event where a point falls within this interval and is labeled 0. And furthermore, uh, there's a requirement that A is to the left of B. So all the points in A are smaller than all the points in B. Um, <clears throat> why is this useful? 
So when V receives these two events, A and B, what it can do is it can estimate the weight of A and estimate the weight of B. Again, by Hoffing's inequality, just take a small number of samples and see what percent of them fall within the event A and what percent of them fall within the event B. <clears throat> and it turns out that opt is um, lower bounded by the minimum of these two weights. And the reason for that is simply that if I have some uh, monotone increasing threshold that classifies even a single point in A correctly, then that means that from that point and to the right, everything else must be classified as one. And therefore all the points in B are classified incorrectly. And vice versa, if you classify even one point in B correctly, that means you're classifying all the points in A incorrectly because the, the classifier must remain at zero at all that point. And so the loss, the event of misclassifying is has probability at least the minimum of these two events. Two minutes. Yes. Um, so using this idea, we're able to prove um, a result which uh, says that there is a, um, a quantitative separation between learning and verifying, a, a quadratic separation in sample complexity. And the idea is to use this um, idea from thresholds, generalize it to a class with D thresholds that has VC dimension D, and then the certificate involves two D events and not just two events. And then you can use results from distribution testing to test that all those events satisfy a certain condition using square root D samples. So that's our first result. Um, our second result says kind of the opposite, that in some cases it's not possible to um, verify more cheaply than learning. And our third result uh, says that in some cases there's a, a qualitative separation. So there are all classes where you cannot learn using random samples, but you can learn using uh, query access to the target function. So you can't learn using random samples, but you can verify using random samples. That's our third result. And um, to summarize, we saw the definition of uh, path verification. We saw that there is uh, sometimes a quantitative separation, sometimes not. There's a case with a qualitative separation where it is suffices to, uh, you can use random samples to verify, but learning requires a query access. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it for future directions. I think two interesting directions are to um, find a complete characterization of uh, the sample complexity gap between learning and verifying. Um, and also to find efficient path verification protocols for some real world uh, classes of hypothesis that are used uh, for machine learning. Thank you very much. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, so we can now move to the next talk. On training over parameterized neural networks in near linear time. And uh, Bing Yu Peng is gonna be giving the talk. Okay, uh, uh, can I start, our, uh, start it now? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for, everyone for coming. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about a little about uh, a little bit of our about our paper uh, about over a uh, training over parameterized uh, neural network in near linear time. And uh, I'm Bing Hui Peng from Columbia University. And this is John who work with Jan Brandt, uh, Zhao Song and Omri. Uh, Jan is from KTH. Uh, Omri and I is from, uh, from Columbia and uh, Zhao is from uh, Princeton. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll start talking about a little bit about NeuralNet. So NeuralNet is the most powerful tool in the past decade, and uh, it works very well in the practice. I will give two examples. The first example is about image recognition on ImageNet. So uh, the performance of NeuralNet keeps uh, increasing, and uh, it finally beats the human level in the year of 2015. And uh, also just the second uh, example is AlphaGo, and AlphaGo uh, beats the top human player of Go game. Uh, in the year of 2017. Okay, uh, well, the deep learning works very well in practice. It's, we are still lack of understanding of it in theory. And there are many uh, topics there, for example, the robustness, 
uh, and also the deep learning is like our uh, explanation and lecture. So, but in, in this work, uh, in this work, well, we will focus on a uh, specific aspect. Uh, we will focus on uh, speed up neural network training. And uh, the outline of this talk is as follow. I will first uh, give a very general introduction to neural net and I will motivate our uh, question. And uh, second, I'll uh, introduce a little bit of over parameterized over neural network. And finally, I will uh, present our result a near linear time training algorithm. Okay. Okay, first I will talk about the motivation behind our problem. Uh, okay, uh, here's a, here are a few facts about neural net. So first, uh, the number of a neural net could be very large. For example, it could be over 10 million parameters for ResNet 18. And the, the, the number of parameters could be even larger if, we, if the neural nets get deeper. And uh, the second fact is that training neural net could be really, really slow. For example, it takes over seven days uh, on eight GPUs for just training a single uh, uh, state, of, uh, state of art uh, language model called BERT. And so, yeah, as one can see, like uh, the, the training time could really uh, be a bottleneck of practical uh, deep learning. And uh, the key question we consider here is that can we step up neural network training? So yeah, I mean, there's no surprise that there have been extensive effort on this topic. So from practitioner, there are many heuristic methods, but uh, in general, there are lack of several guarantees and some of them are not very scalable and they're only targeted for one specific task. Uh, from the series side, there have been many, many advanced uh, optimization theory over the last uh, decades, but uh, most of them uh, only work for convex optimization. Uh, but as one, as, one, uh, uh, as one know, the neural network could be uh, non-convex and non-smooth. So, um, so lots of uh, this theory cannot be uh, applied directly to neural nets. Okay, so before I move on, so actually there's a, there's a caveat here. So, so the, the problem here is that how can we reason about the computation cost if we are not even clear about the optimization landscape? To be particular, we are not even clear about whether the gradient descent or the stochastic gradient descent can converge and whether it can converge uh, to a global optimal and uh, how many iterations the gradient descent can converge. Okay, uh, yeah, but fortunately uh, we, uh, we will study this problem uh, under the over parameterized neural network uh, regime and uh, and we, we 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 use this recent advance from uh, ML and the Siri communities uh, just in the last uh, few years and uh, okay what's the over prime trust uh, framework is about so it, uh, it's a work done by two separate uh, group of people one is by Du Jai a postcode sign and the other by Alan Ju Lee and so in both in 2019 and uh, the okay the same uh, roughly state as follow so it says when the width of the neural net tool is sufficiently large, then the stochastic gradient descent and the gradient descent can probably converge to the global optimal and the training loss can converge to zero. Okay, we, we, we will study the problem under this framework, but uh, and uh, I will uh, begin to uh, talk about the basic setup of our paper. So for just for, uh, for the standard neural net, uh, we consider one hidden layer neural net and we assume there are untraining data drawn ID from the from the distribution and uh, yeah and and uh, we assume the input of, uh, feature less in a d dimensional space and we consider the activation function to be ReLU and uh, just for clarity we will use n to need to know the number of training data m to denote the width of the neural net and d to denote the input dimension and uh, okay what's our over prime trust the neural net uh, our prime the over prime trust means that the width of the neuron uh, uh, of the neural net is much larger uh, than some poly factor of n. So, uh, so essentially, it says the number of neuron is much larger uh, of the in the first layer. Okay. Uh, our main result of this paper is to present the first near linear time training algorithms. And uh, as one can see from this chart, uh, yeah, essentially the number of iterations is uh, just a very it's a just poly, poly log factor. And we achieve uh, mn uh, cost per iteration, and this is uh, almost a tight and linear in the input dimension. Okay, uh, then I will slightly uh, talk about the main techniques uh, used in, in our paper. Uh, so roughly speaking, we use approximate Newton method, and uh, we achieve some uh, speed up by preconditioning, we are sketching. 
So yeah, so uh, very roughly speaking, the key step in our algorithms is to do the following uh, gradient update, where here the W is the weight matrix, F is the prediction of the neural net, and J is the Jacobi matrix. And actually the main cause comes from just computing J times J transpose, which already takes M and squares. Uh, yeah, and uh, our solution is to just approximately compute this J times J transpose and prove that uh, the training that the training algorithms are actually robust to small loss, uh, Lucy here. And the one uh, one very simple idea is is that maybe one can just use spot JL to uh, compute this J times J transpose. Uh, but the, the the problem here is that the conditional man number actually proves it matters in marvel problem. If we just simply use spot JL, then it will bring a, a large overhead additive overhead on n. So instead, we, we divide the, this, the whole uh, training procedure into two steps. In the first step, we solve uh, just a regression problem. And uh, in the second step, we use the solution of the regression problem and do the gradient updates. So uh, this somehow decouples the question. And in the first step, we just use some soft based embedding technique to facilitate the preconditioning. And after we do this preconditioning, we can just do gradient descent to solve this regression problem. And we will get, get very high precision with very little uh, computation costs and iterations. And uh, yeah, and uh, that, that's all the, of the outcome. And finally, I remarked that the technique actually can have much, more, have much wide applications and it can also achieve some speed up on some complex optimization problems as well. Okay, finally, I'll point some uh, future directions on this paper. Uh, yeah, so the, the, there could be many uh, Future work on this. Uh, for example, one can improve the dependence on the ways, or one can maybe uh, extend our result to multiple layer. But I, I will point out one specific, uh, a specific uh, interesting direction that uh, uh, that uh, that's to to use some random uh, randomized linear algebra in neural network training. So so first, uh, the the dimension reduction technique has been stu extensively studied in the TCS community. But uh, it has only been recently used to uh, to practice neural network training just in, in the last uh, two or three years. And uh, the question here is that can we do more uh, on this? And uh, the, the second question is that, so, so this paper provides the first attempt to import randomized linear algebra to neural network training with provable theoretical guarantees. And the question is, is, is can we do more? And uh, maybe one challenging question is, can we go beyond the over parameterized and neural network framework and develop some like uh, uh, you, 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 you use the randomized linear algebra and develop some fast training algorithms for practical neural nets. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move quickly to the next uh, to the next talk uh, on counterexamples to the low degree conjecture. Okay, you can take it away, Alex. Uh, great. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, okay, so this is joint work with Justin Holmgren. So I want to talk about uh, these high dimensional testing problems. So uh, for example, this uh, problem you may have heard of is called planted clique. So planted clique is about distinguishing between uh, two different distributions. In the first distribution, which we call the null model, you just get a random graph has n vertices. Each possible edge occurs with probability one half. On the other hand, in the planted model, you get a, a random graph with a planted k clique, meaning I've taken k vertices and connected them all to each other. And that's a, called a clique. That's what's shown in red here. And so the idea is that I give you a graph either comes from the null or planted distribution, and you have to decide which one it was. And you want to succeed with error probability going to um, zero as n goes to infinity. And so there are all sorts of other problems that um, have a similar type of flavor where there's some kind of a planted signal and buried in some kind of noise. And your goal is to detect the presence or non-presence of this signal. All right, so for these types of problems, the phenomenon of a statistical to computational gap has been observed in all sorts of situations. So what does this mean? Uh, again, in the planted clique setting, this problem has been observed to have these three different phases depending on the size of the clique. So as k, the clique size gets bigger, um, 
you know, first, it's just statistically impossible to detect the clique. Um, when k is quite big, bigger than uh, roughly root n, it's the problem's easy, meaning we know a polynomial time algorithm. And then in the middle is this sort of conjectured hard regime, where statistically you can do it if you're willing to check all the possible cliques, but we don't know a polynomial time algorithm. And we kind of think this is fundamental, that really there should not exist such an algorithm, but we don't know how to prove this, even assuming something like p not equal np or some standard assumption from complexity. Um, so instead, um, typically we try to give some kind of formal evidence to explain why these types of problems are hard. And so this can include, for instance, average, ca uh, average case reductions. This means like if you believe planted clique is hard, you can use this to show some other problem is hard. Or uh, sum of squares lower bounds or other lower bounds against certain classes of algorithms. Um, but one, of, one method I want to talk about today is uh, based on low degree polynomials. And so this idea of um, you know, thinking of low degree polynomials as a restricted class of algorithms uh, is inspired by this line of work on the sum of squares hierarchy, which has been uh, very influential. And so basically when I say a low degree algorithm, I just mean a multivariate polynomial that takes in your whole input and outputs a number. So you can imagine, for instance, if the input is a random graph, there's n choose two variables you get to take any multivariate polynomial you like in all of these variables. Um, and when I say low degree, you should think uh, logarithmic in the dimension. Okay, and so what exactly does it mean for such an algorithm to succeed at a testing problem? Well, here's uh, one definition to have in mind. So under the null distribution, your polynomial has expectation zero, under the planted distribution as expectation one. Um, you know, nothing's special about zero and one, just that they're kind of separated by a constant. Um, and then in either case, the variance is little o of one, right? So if, this, if these conditions hold, then clearly I can distinguish the two distributions just by thresholding this polynomial uh, by Chebyshev's inequality. And what's nice about this particular definition is that it's actually tractable to analyze, both in terms of upper and lower bounds. Um, and for lower bounds, we typically show that even the first three conditions cannot be achieved, uh, ignoring this one in red. And so for problems like, uh, so for plenty clique, for instance, we now know that low degree algorithms succeed in this, in this easy regime where algorithms are known, low degree alg uh, algorithms fail in the uh, conjectured hard regime. Okay, and this is somehow not specific to planted clique. Um, for all of these sort of high dimensional testing problems that I listed on the previous slide, um, we generally sort of believe that these low degree polynomials are as powerful as all polynomial time algorithms. So for all the problems I listed before, we have now verified that uh, low degree polynomials are as good as the best known polynomial time algorithms. And roughly why this happens is because the best known algorithms for these things uh, are often some kind of a spectral method where you build some matrix and do power iteration, and this can be implemented uh, as a polynomial of degree uh, log n. Okay, so this is, uh, this is very nice because it lets us uh, kind of predict in sort of an automatic way, you know, when problems are easy, when they're hard, and sort of explain these statistical to computational gaps. Um, and particularly the method of analysis is like fairly simple compared to things like sum of squares, lower bounds or average case reductions. And so this method is like quite broadly applicable. Um, but of course there is some uh, limit to the class of problems where we sort of believe this conjecture. One example is the uh, three or planted XOR sat. And the reason is that you can solve it using Gaussian elimination, but low degree poly polynomials cannot implement Gaussian elimination. Um, but you know, the, the low degree prediction is not completely wrong because if you instead consider just a slightly noisy version of X or sat, then Gaussian elimination stops working. And now the prediction uh, agrees with the best known algorithms. Okay, and so we'd kind of like to formalize this informal conjecture especially if we want to use it in other areas of computer science like cryptography or something to um, argue why things should be hard. 
But, you know, to do this, we really need to formalize this notion of natural. Like, what exactly is the class of problems where we believe that low-degree polynomials are optimal among two minutes, two minutes. polynomial time algorithms? Thanks. And so um, the first attempt to sort of write down a formal version of this conjecture is by Sam Hopkins in his PhD thesis. And here's sort of an informal statement of his formal conjecture. Um, basically, you assume that Q has IID entries, which is the case for planted clique, right? You have these edges being IID. Um, the planted distribution should be symmetric, uh, like most high dimensional problems are. And then you assume that uh, lo log degree polynomials fail to distinguish. And then the conclusion is that no polynomial time algorithm can distinguish Q from a noisy version of P where this noise operator, um, you know, with a small probability, it resamples each entry of each entry from uh, Q. This basically just adds a little bit of noise to rule out counter examples like the XOR. Okay, um, and the symmetry, you know, typically problems have it, but not clear if it's needed. And so here's basically what uh, we show in this work. We actually refute this conjecture um, by giving a counter example. The counterexample is a little bit unnatural in that each entry of P um, is a real number whose binary expansion encodes a lot of information. Um, but there's sort of a simple way to fix the conjecture so that the, we no longer know how to refute it. And it's that the noise operator should corrupt every entry a little bit instead of um, resampling just a few entries. And the reason is to sort of destroy all these low order bits. And then our second uh, contribution is to show that the symmetry is necessary in the sense that uh, if you remove the symmetry uh, condition completely, then you can also refute the conjecture. Um, and this somehow refines our understanding a bit of what types of problems we expect the um, low degree algorithms to be optimal for. Um, roughly speaking, the proof uses error correcting codes and you can look at the full version of the talk for that. Uh, thanks a lot. Perfect, thank you very much, right on time. Um, so we're gonna move to the last talk of the session before we move to the panel and all the questions. And I hope there will be many because these are really great talks. So uh, should, should I start, start now? Uh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Thank, thank you, you Sebastian, Sebastian, and thank, thank you everyone for attending this talk. So, so today, today I'll be talking about uh, computational complexity of training and learning their two value networks. And this talk will be with Sophie Gold, Gold, Adam, Adam Fivans, Fivans, and Daniel Wright. Right. Pa passing so the, the, sound is, is a, the sound is really weird. I don't know if you can get closer to the mic oh, or something. I can, yeah, yeah, I can try. try. Let, let me try to. That is sound better now. now. No, it sounds, no. I mean- Maybe I try know. to turn down your speaker. Try to turn on my speaker. speaker. Uh, okay, okay. Can you give, give me just one second, second. Maybe, maybe I can. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Can you hear me better now? Uh, yes, but it's still the same sound. Could it be because you're not muted, Sebastian, and you're not using headphones, so the sound goes back? Oh, you think it's me? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, is it better for everyone? Or, or is that still feedback? No? It's, it's a lot better. Okay, sounds good. All right, so yeah, so just to just to recall very quickly, uh, in neural networks, um, we take in the inputs and we have to know them by H1 to Hn, which is just a real number. And uh, there can be many layers. In each layer, there can be many nodes. Each node will have edges uh, from the nodes from the previous layer. And 
at each age there is a weight which is just a real number. The input to this node is the weighted uh, linear combination. Uh, specifically, for example, in this node, the input of this node would be w1 x1 plus w2 x2 and so on and so forth to w and xn. And uh, this is passed through an activation function which gives the output of this node. Uh, each layer can be multiple nodes and this gives multiple outputs. This output can then be used as input to the next node and so on and so forth. So uh, in fact, these people typically use very deep networks, but in theory, even uh, small or, or even uh, shallow networks we don't understand very well. And specifically, this work we only consider depth two network where the activation function in the middle layer is just a value activation. So this is a function that takes in some real number C and the output is just the max between C and zero. Uh, and finally, uh, the top node in our setting is just the identity. So our output is just a linear combination of the output from the middle layer. And throughout this talk, I will use K to denote the number of value nodes in this middle layer. And I will use the view uh, superscript J to denote the weight vector of the edges coming into the J uh, ReLU node. And I will use A1 to AK to denote the weights coming into the identity node at the top. So with this notion in mind, uh, our network is a very simple function. So you just take in X and the output is just sum over I of AI times the ReLU of WI dot X. Okay, so on this ReLU, uh, very simple ReLU networks, we study two problems. The first is the training problem, where we are given a set S of label samples. So these are samples uh, X and Y, where X is the input and Y is the uh, desired output. And our goal is to find a ReLU that uh, gives an output that is as close as possible to the desired output. And this is measure uh, by some loss function, uh, specifically the, the uh, quality at the loss here would be the average over all the sample of some loss function of the actual output of the network that we find and the desired output. And uh, just to remind you again, here the unknowns are the weights of the edges, so it's A1 to AK and W1 to WK. Uh, in this paper, we study a very simple loss function, which is the square loss, so this is fx minus fy squared. And uh, there are two cases to keep in mind. Uh, their complexity will be uh, slightly different. So the first case is a realizable case. So this is a case where there is an unknown, uh, uh, so we have promised that there is an unknown k that actually fits the data perfectly, so it achieves zero error. Another case is a so-called agnostic case where uh, this might not be true. Uh, another very related problem we study here is the learning problem. It's exactly the same as the training problem, except that uh, instead of the same of sample, there is an, an unknown underlying distribution D, and the samples we get are drawn independently at random uh, from D. And the uh, loss now is measured with respect to D instead of the uh, input samples. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, learning theory, we are only consider considering the proper learning gap. So uh, the output must be a k value, we cannot be a arbitrary function. And uh, just quickly note here, learning is harder than training. You can always set D to just be the uniform distribution over the set of input samples and get training algorithm out of learning algorithm. So this means that for the purpose of giving an algorithm, uh, just giving a learning algorithm is enough. But for the purpose of proving harness result, uh, it suffice to prove harness for the training problem. And uh, we will be proving some uh, quantitative harness here. So we will need some normalizing assumptions. Specifically, we assume that the weight vector to each of the value node has norm at most one, and the input also has norm at most one as well. OK, so all the results uh, can be divided into three groups. So NP harness results, uh, algorithms, and running time of low bounds. So the first and most basic result is that we show that training one redo is already NP hard in the agnostic case, uh, even to approximate to a pretty large factor. And only that here for one redo, we need the agnostic setting. 
So in the realizable setting, training one value which uh, can be written as a linear program, so it's easy. Uh, however, uh, from the realizable setting, it turns out that as long as you have two or more uh, number of value nodes, it also becomes empty as well. There is a and just to really note that. Pass, yeah. Passing, there's a question by uh, Ryan. He has his uh, hands raised. You can, uh, you can ask your question, Ryan. Right okay, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was a mistake of it on his part. Okay, keep, keep going. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, just to really know here, yeah, there, there have been uh, quite a few independent and parallel works that do uh, pretty similar results. Uh, I, I'm not going to really detail this talk, but uh, uh, yeah, some, some of these NB harness have also been shown in other papers as well. So these two NB harness say that if you want uh, to approximate the loss, even for a pretty large uh, factor, uh, you can do it. But it turns out that if you are okay with additive error, uh, you can still do quite well. Specifically, in the agnostic case, there is a learning algorithm that takes time exponential in roughly k flip over epsilon square times uh, polynomial. And uh, if you're in the realizable case, uh, this exponent can be uh, reduced further to roughly k flip over epsilon. And note that uh, the uh, dependency on epsilon in the agnostic case is 1 over epsilon square, whereas in the realizable case is 1 over epsilon. So it might be it's pretty natural to ask whether this is intrinsic or not, or whether we should be uh, hoping to get a faster algorithm for the agnostic case. And uh, to answer this question, we prove our type running time go bound. Before I, I can say them, uh, let me quickly uh, re recall some one, hypotheses. One, one minute, Basin, one minute. One minute, okay. Yeah, so, so the hypothesis, uh, the first one is exponential time hypothesis, which is no sub exponential time algorithm can solve tricks that. The second one is a gap ETH, which is a strengthening of ETH that says that two to the little open time algorithm cannot even approximate three that well. So under the gap ETH assumption, we show that in the realizable case, the one over epsilon uh, the exponent is needed. For the agnostic case, we show that the uh, one over epsilon square is needed, and we need an assumption that we call gap ETH for the instance case of R. Basically, it says that approximating the instance case of R in sub exponential time uh, to within constant factor cannot be done. And with this, uh, we get that the one over epsilon square in the exponent is needed for agnostic setting. So this is the uh, separation between uh, these two settings. Uh, yeah, I, I think I will end here. Uh, there are some open questions. Uh, one interesting one is uh, we don't get the type runtime low bound in terms of k, so that, that might be interesting. Um, another interesting one is to prove uh, tight hardness for deep network, even for a uh, depth tree network, we don't know type results there. Um, yeah, another, uh, the last one here is to strength, strengthening the harness to the improper learning case where you can output not just k value, but also other arbitrary function as well. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Basin. Uh, so now we're done with the talks and we're moving to the uh, panel part of the session. So we have at least, you know, a good 10 minutes uh, for discussion and, and questions. So please don't be shy. Let's, you know, make this interactive and, and ask questions. Uh, I can kick things off with, uh, with a small uh, technical question, maybe for uh, being you on, on the training of uh, over parameterized neural networks. Um, so one thing which was not clear in your talk is whether you need to make any assumption on the data, which I, I assume you do, but maybe you can comment on what do you need uh, from the data for the CRM that you mentioned to hold? Okay. Yeah, I think we, we need some separation assumption on the data. So we assume, basically assume for the training data, their, uh, their power distance is at least a data. Uh, okay. I think that's assumption, but uh, the other another like a common assumption uh, in, in this field is that we assume like the some some the, the so some define some kernel matrix and we assume the the least the eigenvalue of this kernel matrix is some so some prime is at least some like lambda, and uh, uh, this two assumption actually closely related, but yeah we we need some assumption 
and imperfect. Exactly. And this this lambda it's assumed for the expected kernel matrix. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but I mean, yeah, yes, it, it's assumed on the expected kernel matrix. But yeah, yeah. I see, I see, I see. And then under these assumptions, it's not true. Like you won't have a strong convexity property. Mm -hmm. uh, like it, it, is it? You know, I was just wondering. Like you, you, you. You do Newton's method to get this log number of iteration, mm -hmm. but do we know that gradient descent itself will not have a log number of iteration in this setting? Uh, yeah, yeah. The gradient descent also, I mean, uh, the number of iteration is like n n squared times log one of epsilon. So, so I mean, uh, yeah. But I think the the overhead is this actual n, n squared term. And I this see. so why why is it n squared times log one over epsilon? Is it because I mean, is it the smoothness or is it the strong convexity that? Uh, yeah, I I think essentially if you will ask this, this as a, like a convex problem, then the conditional number is something like a screwed n. So, but but so okay, so so this n square term come from two part one. Maybe it's just like the condition number is like a screwed n, so you cannot. Uh, sorry, condition number is n, so you cannot beat screwed n. And the yeah. other is that. Uh, you you, you 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 need to take this learning rate to be somehow very small so uh, this one then will increase the the like the number of iteration yeah uh, okay cool thanks for the clarification um there is a talk in the chat by itamar halevi who asked uh, for alex uh, in the counter example to hopkins conjecture drop that drop symmetry relates to dropout of part of data I'm not sure what that means. Um, yeah, I guess I don't know what dropout of data means exactly, but by symmetry, I mean the assumption that, you know, the problem itself is highly symmetric. Like in planted clique, you have um, a distribution over random graphs where every node in the graph is sort of treated the same as every other node. So that type of symmetry is uh, typically present in these high dimensional testing problems. And uh, the, yeah, the dropping symmetry meant if we moved to a problem that did not necessarily have that type of symmetry. So I have another question for you, Alex. Um, I mean, which will show really my limitations in, in computational complexity, but the, the Hopkins conjecture relates to polynomial time algorithm, like a separation with polyno polynomial time algorithm. But this seems very strong because, I mean, planted clique, you can solve it in n to the log n. And, and it's related to the fact that, you know, it's very subtle, this uh, log n degree, because again, log squared n degree uh, will work. So I don't know, is it, do you have any comment about this? Like, it, it, it seems it's not be between, you know, um, yeah, exponential power and... Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right that, uh, that in planted clique, particularly, there's a pretty fine line between easy and hard where, yeah, exactly as you said, log degree polynomials succeed, uh, fail, or sorry, if we're in the hard regime of planted clique, log degree polynomials fail, but log squared degree polynomials succeed. Um, yeah, for a lot of other problems like sparse PCA or community detection, there's a much more pronounced gap where like, you know, in the hard regime, you really need exponential time, so we think. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so planted clique is actually one of the easier hard problems in some sense. And, and for these other problems, you see a bigger gap because you need a much high, larger degree for the, for the polynomial. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. For something like um, the stochastic block model, in the easy regime, you know, polynomials of log degree succeed. But then when you move to the hard regime, suddenly you need polynomials of degree basically n. I see. So there's a, there's a more general form of the conjecture that like if... Um, that polynomials of degree n to the delta correspond to runtime of like e to the n to the delta. So you can actually sort of, um, I see. if you care about sub-exponential runtimes, you can also sort of see this in the low degree polynomials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice. Uh, oh, I see two hands uh, being raised. Uh, let me see, how can I detect who, who they are? Maybe just speak up because I don't I, I don't see who it is. Oh, I see uh, Cameron. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I had a question like concerning the two neural net talks, like for these hard, I wanted to try to understand like one of these talks is giving efficient algorithms and one's giving hardness. Like for the second talk, like could you get around your hardness by saying, I train a network that's a little bit wider, but competes with the best error on my network. Like, is that like one approach to get around the hardness or yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, that, that makes totally sense. So our, our result only holds against uh, if you are restricted to output carrier to and enhance the proper learning uh, that I said during the talk. But yeah, if you are allowed to output uh, wider or deeper network, it's totally uh, possible to to break the load bound. In fact, the coil way algorithm that that I didn't get to mention at the end uh, give a faster algorithm that is faster than our running time load bound, but it is improper. But if I understand correctly, their the output is, is some sort of polynomial. So it's not exactly like just a little bit wider or a little bit deeper than it was. I see, thanks. Uh, Tal, you had a question? Yes, hi, this is a question to Alex. You mentioned uh, very quickly something about, oh, if we want to use the hardness for cryptography. Wanted to ask uh, if you know, look, if, can you say something about any known connections between the planted click, I guess the hard versions of it, and cryptography, one direction or another? Um, yeah, I mean, so uh, my co-author, Justin, is really the expert on this part, but this was sort of like what originally motivated us a little bit to look into this is, you know, whether this type of hardness assumption can be used in other places. I believe the planted clique hypothesis has already been used in some type of cryptography. But uh, if you assume planted clique is hard, you, this implies that um, some, some hardness that's useful in cryptography. And so, you know, this low degree conjecture potentially opens the doors to uh, giving evidence that all sorts of other problems are hard and maybe this could help more broadly. But yeah, I don't, have, I don't do, know enough to say something more specific, unfortunately. Okay, and on the other direction, you also don't know, like, can you prove hardness of some version based on some crypto assumption? Prove that planted clique is hard if you assume, I don't know, LWE or something like that? I believe this is not known. Yeah, this would be great if we could do this, um, but I don't think it's known, yeah. Alex, there is another question for you in the chat. Is there an analog of the low degree conjecture for optimization slash uh, search? I see. Yeah, so these are, this is for a problem um, where you don't have a planted signal and you're just finding, uh, you know, find a large clique in a planted, in a random graph or something. Yeah, so we have, we have studied this problem, this type of problem or this problem specifically from a low degree um, point of view. And we, yeah, there is a sense in which we can show that low degree polynomials can find a, you know, a clique of the conjectured size and not uh, bigger than that. Um, yeah, th so this stems from joint work with myself and uh, David Gamarnik and Akos Jagannath. Um, but yeah, I mean, formalizing the conjecture is a bit different. The, the conjecture would be more like, uh, you know, what exactly is the class of optimization problems for which we believe low degree polynomials are optimal. I don't think anyone has rigorously tried to um, write down a conjecture of this form, but certainly one could would, could try to do this, yeah. Um, cool. Does this answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Um, Mayank uh, from uh, one of the attendees has a question. Uh, I just gave you the option to speak up. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, I had a query uh, with respect to the depth to RELU networks. So uh, uh, your um, results point out to the best hypothesis in the case of uh, 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 dynamic graphs for the uh, uh, depth to uh, uh, RELU networks. Are there uh, specific uh, uh, networks that uh, you want to extend this uh, uh, in in the case of uh, 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 further uh, 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 analysis, or uh, I was thinking more in a general sense in which you can have some sort of convolutions or attentions that can be argumented to this current network to extend or uh, scale in a much uh, uh, 
uh, how do I say it? Uh, uh, in a depth network uh, uh, fashion, uh, so, so that it can be um, generalized to a much. Uh, yeah, I think that, yeah, I think that, that that's a very good question. Uh, I guess one thing I mentioned is is about the three network, but but your idea the network that we consider is only a uh, fully connected network. So you could also try to ask about network with other architecture like convolution network. I think that that also makes perfect sense. Uh, I don't think I will harness to extend that, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Oh, cool. Thank you. Great. Uh, and I have a question for uh, Jonathan uh, Schaefer. So I was just wondering, do you think there is an analog of VC dimension verification? Come again? Uh, is there an analog of VC dimension uh, for verification? Yeah, so that's uh, an open problem that I think would be very interesting to uh, look at. Um, at the moment, uh, we know a lower bound uh, of square root D for verification, where D is the VC dimension, but uh, we, we don't have any further um, uh, characterization of the, of the sample complexity gap. I see, so no upper bound at all in terms of the, uh, I guess it's always upper bounded by VC. Okay, I see. Yeah. But that, I think that would be a very interesting direction. Uh, Mustafa has a question. Um, yes, thank you for um, having me uh, to, to get this great opportunity. So my question is for the second paper, Interactive Proofs for Verifying Machine Learning. I've been wondering whether there are any implications for computational complexity theory. Are machine learning problems special in any way such that applying interactive proofs on them shed new lights on complexity theory? Uh, I think your question was, what is the difference between uh, complexity here in the case of the application of machine learning versus general uh, computational complexity? That, that was the question? Um, no, no, yes, I mean by complexity, computational complexity theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you think of like the differences in computational complexity, you're talking about uh, algorithms that have some fixed input and you want to find an output. While in uh, learning, you don't have a fixed input, there's some unknown distribution, and you get a random sample from that distribution. And then you need to put an output for that. So it's not, it's not exactly the same because the, the, you, there's no fixed input. So there are no implications on understanding the fundamental limits of efficient computation, right? Ah, okay, you're talking about using the results from the verification. Um, I think that would be an interesting direction, but I don't, I don't know about any, any way to use it currently. Great. So you are driven fully by machine learning itself. Right? Come again? So the motivation here is machine learning. So, um, um, yes, I think also, also like applications in machine learning, also there's other uh, applications we can think of. Um, for instance, um, it might be possible to uh, use this kind of uh, result for replication of scientific publications. So you can imagine a situation where somebody um, publishes you know, does some experiment and get some results and then they publish that. And then traditionally what happens in science is that people go and replicate the experiment. So they need to repeat the whole experiment and uh, check that they get the same result. But maybe instead of just publishing the original paper, what you could do is you could uh, publish your paper and also publish some sort of prover. And then if somebody wants to verify that publication, what they can do is maybe they can um, verify uh, using uh, interactive proof with that prover and that would allow them to uh, take less samples in the verification process. So instead of replicating the whole publication, they're only gonna be um, taking less samples in their, in their replication. 
So that's that's one additional kind of thing you might want to do with with this verification. So do you envision there are going to be additional applications based on your paper, which we do not currently see in the foreseeable future? Um, I think at the moment, this is a, a purely theoretical, uh, theoretical thing. I think in order to make it uh, practical, we would need to find um, interactive proof for, for verification for uh, classes that are actually used in the real world. At the moment, we have um, an example for a sort of toy class of de uh, de-thresholds, which I kind of described in the talk. Um, but you'd wanna you'd wanna get results for actual stuff like uh, linear regression or decision trees or neural networks or some, something that that's uh, more practical and then that might actually be useful in the real world. Great, thanks thanks a lot, Thank Jonathan, so for this answer. Um, so maybe if there is no more uh, burning questions. Uh, I think this might be a good time uh, to end the session. There is another session, a very interesting one uh, that just started. Um, so let me see, no more question. No, no more question. Okay, thanks to all the speakers and uh, see you in the other session.